Hi, my name is Chance, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending this evening's program. The Dole Student Advisory Board is composed of KU students committed to the work of the Dole Institute. We attend regular meetings, assist in events like this, and plan an SAB-sponsored program every semester. Members of the SAB receive great opportunities to network with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact the Dole Institute. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you. If you enjoy this evening's program, please let us know by contacting us on Facebook, Twitter, or through our, e or through our website email. Your attendance and feedback help shape future programming. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of tonight's presentation will be available on our website soon. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. After the interview, we, have, we will have some time for audience questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student helper with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. Finally, if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers here in the hall and they can assist you. And now, please welcome Director Bill Lacey. Thanks, Chance. Thanks to all of you for joining us for this very uh, unique and important program tonight. Uh, for those of you that I, that I know, I've been here for 11 years and we've never done a program where we had students uh, actually be our speakers. And that's something that's very exciting to me and something that is long overdue. We have our student advisory board programs that we do every semester that is run by the students and organized by students. Uh, but tonight, we're doing something really very different. I'm very excited about it, and I appreciate all of you joining us for this. If you've been to our post-election conference, you know that this is the format that we normally use. We use um, these two tables facing each other, and I realize that some of your seats may not be ideal seats, but it works best for the discussion to let our uh, uh, participants talk amongst each other, and then you're witnessing that. And as Chance said, we will do a little bit of Q&A afterwards. So if you have questions, you'll get an opportunity to ask uh, a question. Now, this program was conceived as a way to better understand the hopes and fears of the millennial generation in regards to our national debt. Let's begin by meeting our outstanding student panel. I'm going to each e ask each of you, starting with Sabah, to introduce yourself, give your hometown, your year of school, and your major. Sabah? Hi everyone, I'm Sabah Anise and I am a sophomore from Wichita, Kansas, majoring in Religious Studies with a pre-med emphasis. Hello, I'm Will Edmondson, I'm from Urbandale, Iowa, <coughs> I'm majoring in Political Science and Economics, and I'm a sophomore. My name is Cheyenne Ernst, um, I'm from Overland Park, Kansas, and I'm actually still a high school student. I'm a senior at Blue Valley North High School, and I'm planning to go to Northeastern University in Boston and major in Chemical Engineering. Uh, hello, I'm Keller Eady. I'm a freshman from Wichita, Kansas, and I'm studying political science and global and international studies. Hi, everybody. I'm Jordan Koch from Lawrence, Kansas, and I'm a senior studying math and economics. Hi, I'm Karam Robinson, otherwise known as Q. I'm a freshman at the University of Kansas. I'm traditionally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, <coughs> came here actually from Austin, Texas, though. That's where I went to high school. and. Um, oh, I'm an African-American studies major. I don't know if I said that. Hi, I'm Adam Steinhober. I'm a freshman from Leewood, Kansas, and I'm majoring in political science. I'm Elizabeth Mears. I'm a second year law student with a uh, undergraduate degree in accounting from Wichita State. I'm originally from Holton, Kansas. I'm Vijay Ramasamy. I'm also a senior from Blue Valley North High School at Cheyenne, and I'm from Overland Park, Kansas, and I'm planning on attending Johns Hopkins University next year to study public health. My name is Amanda Gress, and I'm a senior from Overland Park, Kansas. I study economics and political science. OK, let's have a round of applause for our participants. <laughs> Thank you all for agreeing to do this. A uh, couple things, we're going to take a look at a couple videos in a minute, but I did want to point out that we thought we would show a, a, uh, one of our debt clocks over here. That's the national debt clock. When we started the program, it was at 18229540000 So literally in the last four minutes, our national debt's gone up over $3 million. So you can follow that tonight and, and uh, kind of keep track of that. We're going to look at, uh, so we all kind of start with a base of knowledge here tonight. 
and we've shared this with our students already, we're going to show two videos that we're able to find online. Uh, one is a very, very uh, basic video that will uh, feature former Comptroller General of the U.S., David Walker, describing the national debt and its significance. And then we'll go to a clip that was especially prepared by another organization that addresses how the debt may change millennial lives. So let's take a look at the videos. America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, has a huge and growing debt problem, which Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Michael Mullen, called the greatest threat to our national security. Here's why. In 2012, the federal government spent $3.5 trillion, but received only $2.4 trillion in taxes. That left an annual deficit of $1.1 trillion. That burden, along with prior deficits and debt levels, have basically been passed on to our children. We older folks certainly won't be paying it back. Even in 2000, when America last had a real budget surplus, our public debt carried forward from prior years was $3.4 trillion. At the end of 2012, the public debt had escalated to $11.3 trillion. Include intra-governmental obligations like money we borrowed from Social Security and Medicare trust funds and add the state and local government debt like European countries do, and our total government debt was 138% of the economy, or GDP, at the end of 2012. That exceeds every country in Europe except Greece, and we sure don't want to follow Greece's bad example. The government has other explicit liabilities, primarily unfunded retirement obligations to our veterans and civilian employees, with a present value today of another $7 trillion. Add the federal government's $2 trillion in other commitments and contingencies, and the independent actuary's estimate of the present value of cash flow shortfalls for Social Security and Medicare, and you break through the top of the chart. In total, as of September 30, 2012, our country was about $70 trillion in the hole. That's about $225,000 for every man, woman, and newborn child in this country. This debt and the interest on it is everybody's problem. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest are expected to exceed all federal revenues after 2030. Based on historical levels of taxation, this would leave no funds for spending on defense, homeland security, education, infrastructure, research, the poor, and it will put increasing pressure on Medicare and Social Security, which seniors depend on. Moreover, for the sake of the next generation, for us to spend and promise more to ourselves than we are willing to pay for is ethically and morally wrong. There are solutions, and we can solve this problem. However, we the people need to demand that our political leaders fix this problem before it's too late. There are two big categories, defense spending and everything else. Military spending goes up during wars, and the conflicts of the past decade have been no exception, which means the cuts have fallen on everything else. Yet these programs include investment in medical research, science, energy, technology, and foreign aid. Without these investments, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon and wouldn't have developed search engines like Google. This category also includes basic investment in the roads and bridges we depend on every day. These discretionary programs have broad social and economic benefits. All of these things are being crowded out by health care, which is already one quarter of all federal spending and growing fast. The way our government spends money on health care today, with lots of money for treatment but very little for preventive care, is a major problem for young people. Right now, only three cents of every dollar of healthcare spending goes to prevent conditions and diseases that could actually save money down the road. Young people would be better off physically and fiscally if the government spent more on prevention. Most government healthcare spending today comes from two major programs. The largest is Medicare, which helps pay for healthcare for all the baby boomers over age 65 a task which gets more expensive as more of them become eligible. The next largest program is Medicaid, which pays for health care for families and individuals with low incomes or disabilities. 
Despite the fact that the U.S. spends more on health care than any other country, we are not the healthiest. Why? One reason is that the government and many private plans pay doctors for how many things they do, not how well they do them. This means more procedures and tests, some of which don't make us any healthier. The U.S. healthcare system spends a lot on administration, like billing agents and insurance underwriters. This doesn't directly improve anyone's health. We also use more medication and more expensive medical technology than most other countries. Finally, long-lasting diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and cancer are expensive to be cured and controlled. Because these last a long time, everyone would be better off if we could delay or prevent these chronic diseases altogether. Besides health care, Lisa also faces a serious economic situation and high unemployment rates. The unemployment rate among 16 to 24 year olds is double that of all other age groups. In addition, students are graduating from college with more debt than ever, up nearly 50 percent from 2004. Young people are unable to save, making them more likely to need government assistance in the future. And businesses suffer because fewer people have money to spend. So, you see, increased personal debt slows economic growth on the national level. The less money people have, the less they spend and invest. This, in turn, puts greater strain on the national debt. Since the government collects less in taxes and spends more to help people who are struggling, this is where some national debt can be a good thing, if it helps break that cycle. But if left unchecked, it can make for a worse economy and fewer opportunities for young people. Jump in. Well, my answer might have been different before you put me here because I have a very good view of the national debt clock. Um, but but I, what really concerns me isn't so much the size of the debt. Um, that number for me is very abstract. What concerns me is that we're going to get to a situation where government isn't going to be able to, to do the things that I want it to do. And I think that the things that I want it to do are pretty reasonable. I would like for government to build roads and make sure that bridges don't crumble. I would like to make sure that if people are hungry, they're able to eat, and that if people aren't able to afford to send their kids to a private school, they can send them to a school. Uh, and I'm worried that we'll get to a situation where those things aren't possible. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly would lead us to that point or what could get us to that point, but if, there, if the national debt is unsustainable, then maybe that would happen, and I think we can all agree that that would be pretty, pretty bad. Uh, I I agree with Amanda. I, what doesn't about what about the debt that doesn't really concern me is the number. It's really not that large compared to percentage of GDP to a lot of the richer countries. But I think it betrays a mindset of the government that is a little more worrisome. That is that we can spend what we want, we can do what we want, whether or not that has an impact on you know future generations. So the problem becomes when the government thinks that they can spend things and spend money on things that may not be as important as we think they are, whether it's for their own personal political interests or just misguided thinking and research. Either way, I don't think the actual number of the public debt is so important so much as that the government is in a current mindset that isn't looking forward so much as looking at the present. Yeah, well, I agree that there is definitely a problem with the government and its priorities a lot of times. What really concerns me is how people don't seem to realize how significant the national debt is. I mean, obviously our economy is still functioning right now. The country is still functioning. But especially with my generation, I just don't feel like any of us, well, obviously the people here know about it, but most people aren't really concerned with it at all. They know it's a very large number, and they know that, well, someone's going to have to deal with that someday. But I don't really feel like they realize, oh, we're going to have to deal with that. So like they've said, it's not necessarily the number, because we've shown that with debt, we can still function, but it's the fact that no one seems to want to take responsibility for it, and no one's starting to realize that, oh, we actually have to worry about this and not let it get too big. I agree with you all in that it's definitely a problem and it's something that needs more attention, but I actually think that the number is also disconcerting. I think $11 trillion, although it is abstract, 
I can't picture that much money. I think that is still recognizable as a huge value, and I think that definitely needs to be paid attention to as well. Yeah, what? that's not just like, oh, I'm sorry. That's not just like money that's pulled out of nowhere. Like the government accrues that money through selling bonds and things like that. So if we don't address the fact that that is actual money, then we run into the problem of rampant inflation and other things like that that like if we just continue to disregard the number and like spend more and more, we're going to run into equally as horrible problems if we don't figure out a balance, like a balanced way to address the issue. Yeah, you, you mentioned bond prices, uh, Cheyenne. And when I think of debt, I think of it as an investment. And what concerns me about debt is when your investment starts to go bad. When our bond prices, the interest rate starts to go way up, and then people start to lose trust in our government. And I think that the path that we're going on with our debt um, is definitely one where people could start to lose that trust in the government and that we wouldn't be able to borrow money at the low rates that we're borrowing it at right now. So, you know, this is definitely a, a long term um, problem that I see. But as, as far as short terms, I, I want the, the government to be spending when a recession such as 2008. And I want the government to be investing as things uh, such as education, which I believe have a really high return um, on the investment. I, I kind of agree with Adam when he was talking about just the store of if, lack of responsibility when it comes to the national debt. Because uh, as you guys saw in 2012, when it came time to pass a budget and Congress wasn't ready to do that, it's like, that's your job. You know, you are supposed to be doing that. We are paying you to do that. And when people only notice the national debt, when problems like that arise, then that's contributing to the problem and to the lack of responsibility that our Congress men and women have, in my opinion. And I don't think it's a problem that's going to stop, I mean, especially with things like Social Security and Medicare and all the entitlements that we have, unless there's serious policy changes that happen or serious reform that happens. I think it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And like Will said, we're going to see increase, increase in interest rates. We're going to see slower economic growth. And that's just bad for everybody. So unless the problem is taken care of right now and steps are taken right now, it's just going to compound and compound and compound. My thoughts on the deficit are more so predicated off of like, as we saw in the video of 25% of the money is going to health care. The issue is not like um, I think the focus on where the money is going, though, that I think often gets highlighted. I think the issue is largely that institutions privatize health care, and when health care is privatized, it makes inefficiencies as per all the insurance costs and other costs, not the actual health of the people, um, which I think is largely an issue. And when we focus on national debt, while I do think it's an importance to our everyday realities, especially as students, I think it's particularly important that, um, you know, it's not our job necessary to hold um, the economy and figure out how to solve it, but it's our job to hold people accountable, which is what I think is accurate about the representation of Congress um, and the inability to um, kind of force public policy to represent the people. Um, and I think that that's largely where we should have our focus is where is the money going and why is it going? I think our, you know, we're, we often become disconcerned with that. and numbers of money that seem really extreme to us complicate the situation. And I don't think it's the number, but again, if the investment that we're making is a representation of accurately a <laughs> depiction of what people want. Yeah, you talked about policy. And I remember the first statement in the first video was that it's, it's a biggest threat to our national security. And so right there, that's the assumption that our national security is our first budgetary priority. If you look at the numbers, uh, defense spending, well, just one fifth of the spent defense spending would uh, cover that huge gap in Social Security, um, and then we would be good with our Social Security funds. So I definitely think what you're saying is, is so true that, you know, us young people, when we have priorities like education and like health care, that when this debt is, debt is increasing, it's increasing in, in a way that we don't agree with. Um, we'd rather see education, we'd rather see health care, we'd rather see highways than, than things like defense spending, um, which is a policy that, that we ultimately um, sometimes don't support. I think another thing that needs to like happen is a lot of those policies like Social Security um, are good things in some senses and were good things at one point in time. But our society continues to progress. And if we continue to sit on those policies that were implemented um, decades ago, we're not allowing like 
the social aspect of our government to progress with the economic aspect, and that's where we run into problems. Because like, we're growing at different rates and different things are happening. So unless we address like those social policies and allow those to shift um, to go along with our population growth and economic growth and the like shifts and trends of what our generation thinks, we won't be able to remedy the problem that we have with like how we're spending our money. You mentioned, you know, the the fact, sorry, this is going to be a really shaky intro, but basically we were talking about how uh, both you and you were talking about our healthcare spending. And I well, I agree with you that there are inefficiencies in private, uh, private healthcare. There's also inefficiencies in public healthcare and Medicare and Medicaid are great examples of that. And both of those are contributing to our national debt in that the government keeps going, hey, we can just borrow money from them and no one's gonna notice and we won't have to pay it back. And that's a huge, huge problem because the people who vote, largely, are going to be the people who benefit from those sorts of programs. And no offense to everybody here who probably does vote, but our generation <laughs> doesn't vote that much. <laughs> and so we're at a disadvantage in that context where we don't have the political capital to be like, you need to fix that for when we get there because we simply don't have the have the prowess to do so. I obviously absolutely love the plug for voting. Um, <laughs> I also think that what's really important is that we look at other countries and try to get a better idea of what's working. So I liked the part of the video that showed not just that we spend a lot of money on healthcare, but also reminded us that, hey, we spend 17% of our GDP on healthcare, which is way more than other countries that actually have honest to goodness socialized medicine, and we also get much worse outcomes in terms of having higher infant mortality rates. And so it might not be the worst thing in the world to take a look at other countries and say, well, I know that's not how we do things in the US right now, but if it's working, maybe we should be more open to trying something new if we think that the deficit and the debt is something that's worth addressing. Absolutely. And can, can I go ahead and go in there? As an in, uh, international studies major, I always approach these things comparing the United States to other countries in the world. And I think there's a lot to be learned for similar developed countries like those in Europe. And I understand some people might not be open to the idea of socialized medicine, but I think there's something to be said about uh, a voting generation that looks at the healthcare system and we can all agree, despite partisanship, that this isn't working and that we keep doing it. So whether or not you think that a different system should be more socialized or more privatized, it's pretty clear that there's a problem right now. And as far as the bu public debt is concerned, I think we can also look more broadly at European countries that are trying to curb their own issues of public debt. Countries like Greece that have an even larger debt problem than us are trying to do things that are actually pretty similar to what we're doing and they're not working. Uh, austerity cut measures that have been implemented by the European Union have not been showing positive results, which indicates that there's a greater problem just that we're spending too much and that uh, what we talked about earlier is we need to look at where this money is going, how we can use it more efficiently, and how our budget should actually be allocated, as opposed to just saying we need to stop spending money. I want to get some thoughts from you guys on how do we get to this point? And I realize you're not responsible for it, but you're going to have to face it at some point. So just from your perspective, how did we get to this point where we have this clock now that's up to 559, which is 22 million more than when we started tonight? I think not to, oh. oh, go ahead. Okay, not to offend you <laughs> and anybody else in this room who might be a Generation X or anywhere in there, but I think that Part of the problem with our national debt stems from, you know, the environment that people of that generation grew up with, grew up in, where, you know, you can have it all. You can have the picket fence and the 2.5 kids and the big house, but the problem is that's not really sustainable in the long run. Yeah, I think part of the way that we got here was kind of the mentality that, well, we're America. We know what we're doing. We're a stable country. We can take on this debt. It'll be fine. It's always been fine, we'll be fine, we've always come out of it. And well, yeah, we are a pretty good country, we have a lot of resources, we know how to handle most situations. The debt, it's just gotten too much to the point where we can't always say, oh, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine, although that's what people keep saying. We're seen as the adults on the world stage, and so everyone's like, okay, they'll be fine, they'll be fine, 
but eventually it's not necessarily going to end up so well. I think one of the most striking things I saw from the video was that we're spending three cents out of every dollar on preventative care, and we're spending so much money after the fact. And I think what Keller said was just exceptional is that we should be focusing on how public policy can really help people and how to shift public policy in a way that we're preventing problems from occurring. And I think we've been kind of reactive rather than proactive in public policy, and that's just spent so, so much money. And that if we understand that as the debt increases, we're gonna have to increase taxes, and that's gonna create more people that are in worse positions, and that's gonna create more and more money, is that sure, deficit spending can be good in the short term to stimulate the economy, but at some point, it has to stop. I was once uh, on, listening in on a congressional hearing in DC uh, with a really smart woman named Alice Rivlin who works at the Brookings Institute. And she knows way more uh, about the national debt than I do. But she started off by saying that, well, she finished by saying that um, it was not a good, that we need to put aside pointing blame because that's not helpful because we'll really have to work together to move forward. Um, that said. I think that it is pretty easy to look back through our history at the national debt and maybe instead of looking at other countries, we could just look at administrations that have managed to have a budget surplus instead of a budget deficit. Uh, I believe the last one that did was President Bill Clinton's administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can maybe look at some policies since then that have really contributed to the deficit in the short run. So obviously, um, foreign wars are pretty expensive. I, that was mentioned in the video. Uh, large tax cuts. Uh, we have mostly been talking about spending, but obviously there are two sides to the equation of do we have enough money to pay our bills, and if the country is, if there are going to be very large tax cuts, uh, then I think we need, and it, it is obviously very easy to vote for tax cuts, uh, but I think that there needs to be an honest conversation that happens during those policy discussions that says, all right, we would like to cut taxes, but what are we going to sacrifice to make that a, a reality? Uh, to answer the question about how we got here, I think the real answer to that question is, well, b back when we were making these budgetary decisions and everyone decided we can spend more money, we can spend more than we're taking in, uh, everyone was asking, why shouldn't we? Because there's a lot of good reasons as to why spending more than we take in can be beneficial. In uh, most of my classes, uh, we talk about this thing called the collective action problem, which is basically this idea that when everyone uh, gets together to create one thing that benefits everyone, uh, individually we have an incentive to free ride or not contribute to the public good. So in this instance, the public good would be uh, the, what, what the programs that benefit from money that are outside of our budget. And the problem is, is that people all want that thing. We all want those programs. We all want those benefits. But we don't want to individually pay the price for those things. And the great thing, great in this example at least, about the public debt is that we can all benefit from it and none of us individually have to take responsibility for it. So in order for us to address the problem of the public debt, it takes all of us to make individual cuts for something that we're not individually suffering from at the moment to help people in the future, which is, I think, very uh, opposed to like human nature as far as self-interest is concerned. I think largely another issue is the majority of the people who control the situation have been there for a while and we discussed Congress and we discussed the ways that you know we have budgetary plans and when we were trying to figure out the budget crisis um, perception-based politics shapes a lot of the way that our community reacts to those issues. So when that was the crisis, everybody was really upset at Congress that they couldn't figure it out. And then one day they happily came to the resolution and we passed, you know, you know, we passed our own check, I guess, that, you know, that we figured out the budget, which is largely untrue. But I think that the inability for the people affected by large amounts of these issues, including us and the younger generation, our view on the economy is um, largely perceptional. And so when we hear things like debt crisis or um, we hear things like our deficit is too large to resolve, I think it insulates um, the economy into a way that we don't have to think about it or talk about it or that it's something abstract out there that we don't have to engage in, which forces us to not engage in forms of civic participation that force us to vote or force us to push limits on politicians that create issues that exist currently. I think that the people who are 
I don't mean to say people as in a certain demographic or old people or anything like that. <laughs> I rather just mean people in general. When we don't share opinions about a certain policy and we think of the economy, I think that that largely um, shifts the focus away from like things that we think are important. What should we be spending on? And it forces people to be able to place blame. Like I don't want money to be spent on um, healthcare in the way that it is without a resolution or a plan or a way to resolve that. My call was not like. Uh, or nobody else on this panel, I think, is saying, like, we have to socialize healthcare. But I think that we're just saying, like, these are discussions that we need to have. Are other countries doing things better? Or how can we change things? And those things force us to kind of reconcile with the way that the government's been spending money. And if it stays some abstract thing that it's like a bunch of trillion dollars that none of, none of us have access to, <laughs> <laughs> we all rather, you know, insulate the issue and say, we'll get to it when we get into politics, instead of saying, well, we're all going to be really poor because we're going to graduate with a bunch of debt. <laughs> I think on the other hand to that is while we're insulating it, insulating ourselves from politics, kind of going back to our generation doesn't vote in most instances. I know a lot of the people, at least that I know, don't go vote um, even in primary elections. We feel like our vote doesn't matter because our politicians aren't making the changes that we want. They're not following, they're not making changes, they're not helping us in any way, so why would we go vote because it's not benefiting us in any way? So it, it is insulating us, but then we decide, well, we're not going to do anything about it, so it's kind of a double-sided coin in that aspect as well. Yeah, and I think that a large portion of the problem is that a lot of people in our generation just slightly, kind of like what you were saying, refuse to deal with relevant issues that are challenging. Like there's so much, in dealing with the national debt or like healthcare reform or anything like that, there's a lot of hurdles that we have to overcome because there's a lot of competing opinions. And no one really wants to take on that challenge. I mean, like people that are sitting here like us do, but we don't represent necessarily um, uh, like a cross section of all of the people our age. And I feel like if we can figure out a way to encourage young people to address these issues when they're young and not just say, like, because everyone in Congress is 50 plus, I have to wait until then to get involved in politics, then we'll be able to actually shape our country and our government in a way that's beneficial to the, like, upcoming society and doesn't just benefit the ones, like, retiring. Yeah, I agree with that. And you know, a lot of the, the aspects of policies is you want economic growth and you want to encourage economic growth. And a lot of that uh, deals with, with fiscal policy and with cutting taxes. But I think there's a type of economic growth that's, that's good for the short run to, to boost uh, GDP in the short run. And then there's long-term consequences of those tax cuts. And those long-term consequences, they create deficits. And those deficits that are created by the tax cuts, if there's not enough GDP, growth is multiplied by shocks that we've had, such as the dot-com bubble bursting or the Great Recession of 2008. So I think that um, a lot of policies have been good for economic growth, that our Congress needs to be more receptive in their fiscal policy to certain shocks that we've had. Um, and for instance, we're, we're rebounding from our recession now, and I think our fiscal policy uh, should reflect that for long-term economic growth that, that takes into account these big issues that are going to affect not just the members of Congress and, and their primary donors and constituents, um, but, but us in the future as well. I think it's also really important to recognize that there is an economic ben benefit from sp the government spending money in, a, as, in addition to the government cutting taxes. So we know that when you go out and build a road, for example, during a recession, that means, or not during a recession, that means that somebody has a job and they're able to take the salary that they get from that job and go spend it in the local economy. Um, I remember reading a really interesting study a little while ago where um, the Fed took their big model that they used to predict the economy uh, and looked at what would happen if the government spent an additional 1% of GDP, so a pretty large amount of change, uh, from 2009 for five years. Uh, and then they looked at 2030 to see what the difference in the deficit would be. And they found out that, the, that spending money in the short run during a recession actually meant that there was a smaller debt quite a few years out because there had been that dynamic effect in the economy of people being able to have jobs and spend that money. Um, I don't know that that's always thought, I don't know that we always think about that when we talk about cutting programs. I know that the current budget 
um, that's been proposed in the House and the Senate cuts discretionary spending on social programs pretty drastically. And I don't think that's something we think about when we think about the food assistance program. I don't think we think about, wow, every dollar that's spent in that is going to go immediately be spent in a grocery store, maybe in my community. Let me ask you guys um, if you thought about how this, how the national debt might affect you personally in your life. Let, let me, let's ask a warm up question. Okay, <laughs> show of hands. How many of you think that you will receive social security benefits from the government when you retire? I'm like the oldest one here. So no, hold up, <laughs> hold up high. No. I want to do a count. So one, two, three, four, five. Half the panel. Half of you guys think you're never going to see those. Talk a little bit about that. How does that make you feel? I think we shouldn't see them. I think social security is a really outdated program that was really really good like in the 1950s or the 19 like 30s when it was implemented during the new deal but now it's like because of how the shift in population is occurring right now it's not good and like because our generation is getting more educated and higher education tends to lead to a smaller amount of children maybe in the future we will have a more balanced like input and output ratio but right now the number of people paying money into social security with our generation is just like not enough at all to pay for the pe like the amount of people that are going to require it in the future. So at least for now, we, I feel like we have to postpone Social Security or otherwise we're going to run into uh, a really massive problem with a lot of really frustrated people that put a lot of money into the system but can't get anything out of it. And I feel like our generation is going to have to bear that burden of like, probably putting money in and not getting money out, but I feel like in the long term that's going to be better because we're going to be able to develop a different program that's better for our current situation and not the situation from 60 years ago. Honestly, I really don't think that, at least the way Social Security is going now, that I am ever going to see a dime from the Social Security Administration. I mean, when you think about, like, Cheyenne was sort of pointing out the number of people that are going to require social security assistance versus the number of people like me and the rest of the people on this panel that will be paying into that. It, the numbers just don't add up. There are way more baby boomers than there are people of our generation. And so you kind of have to think, what can we do to either reform social security, come up with something else entirely, or you know maybe tweak a little bit to make it better? or are we going to have to just go along that road and sort of see where it leads us? Yeah, I have uh, two opinions on this topic. One is optimistic and one is pessimistic, but they both result in the same answer, which I think is we still will have Social Security. The pessimistic one is that we're not gonna fix anything. Um, we're gonna be in a terrible place by the time that I have access to Social Security. It's just that I think Social Security will be the last thing we let go of before everything goes under. <laughs> The optimistic view, the optimistic view I have is that... That was uh, a pessimistic <laughs> view, right, Keller? Okay, I just wanted to make sure about that. The, the optimistic view I have is that we will be able to tackle these problems. We just won't get rid of Social Security so much as reform it. I don't think Social Security is an inherently flawed idea so much as that the way we execute the program is very poor. Not only do we have problems like with the baby boomers and with the fact that we're promising people these funds at... Uh, what is, seems to be a relatively early age compared to how much money we're taking in. There's also the problem, it was mentioned earlier, that we steal funding from the uh, Social Security, from Medicare, from Medicaid budgets to fund other projects that are also in the budget, which is really absurd when you think about it since we're all allocating funding to different policy measures in the budget either way. But the point is, is that if we stop, if we stop doing that, if we do things like either cut spending or raise taxes or specifically with these programs we raise the retirement age. If we take the appropriate steps that many intelligent uh, economists and public policy uh, of, uh, analysts and experts have done and shown could, would be effective way to solve social security, I think in an optimistic lens that we may still have it uh, when we get to that age, but it's going to take some work. I, I think I agree kind of with what you're saying about us having to take, you know, non, <laughs> no-brainer steps, according to economists. But the thing is that the things that economists recommend are usually not very popular overall amongst the United States. 
Um, like, a lot of economists think that we should legalize drugs, and not just, like, marijuana. I mean, like, everything, because we spend a ton of money, you know, going in and trying to catch people and trying to prevent uh, drugs from being smuggled across borders, mainly Canada. <laughs> but we spend a lot of money doing things like that, and we really shouldn't, because a lot of those crimes are victimless crimes, so-called victimless crimes. But no politician would ever, ever recommend that, especially in a state like Kansas. Who's going to, you know, be like, oh, Kansas is going to be the next state to legalize marijuana. That's not going to happen. And so we really have to consider what is the popular thing to do, not just among the United States overall, but among the population of the United States that votes. Probably not touch Social Security. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I that's, feel like no matter true. what you do with Social Security, it's going to frustrate a large majority of the masses. But um, you were kind of talking about this earlier. Like, people are really short-term thinkers. And uh, I don't think we can fix that problem. Like, if you're 50 years old and you're a short-term thinker, you're probably going to be a short-term thinker forever. But I feel like if we can... <laughs> I feel like if we can convey the benefits that it will have for our children or our grandchildren, um, we'll sort of have that like, sort of like that pathos connection that makes people see like, even though I'm getting the short straw right now, it's going to be better in the future to make these reforms. So like maybe I won't get as much out of Social Security as I put into it. But in the long run, it's going to be better for all of the future generations. And so I feel like if we can encourage the population to make those sacrifices and be comfortable with making those sacrifices, then we will be able to reform it. To go back to your original question about uh, how we think it'll be dealt with or if we're concerned, I would say I'm absolutely concerned that my generation is going to have to you know, really deal with this burden of the national debt. And I'm as you were saying, you're optimistic on women. I really hope as well that you know we're able to tackle this problem and that we can put more funding into research so that we can come up with policies to figure out how to you know, bring this debt down. Um, as far as what you brought up with the legalization of drugs, I certainly don't think that that should happen, you know, legalizing drugs. But I do think that certain policy uh, improvements should be made and I think yeah I think that if we continue to just put more funding into research we can find ways to better our economy and hopefully tackle this debt sooner I'm I think as a, oh no go ahead as a, I think as a higher education student right now in the state of Kansas um, I've seen how a deficit can negatively impact my generation right now um, with rising tuition rates due to the uh, enormous uh, budget deficits that the state of Kansas has had, it's pretty obvious that when there's a deficit, it puts more pressure on the government's priorities. And it, ultimately, the people who decide those priorities are the people in office. We've talked a lot about how our generation doesn't really vote, so ultimately the people in office that are deciding those priorities have the interests of, of their voters in mind, which unfortunately isn't any of us at the table. And so when those, those policy officials decide to have programs like austerity and they cut higher education, we see the impact uh, right now. So I think that it does concern me because a lot of times the people that are voting are, are prioritizing things in the way that, that I don't like. I think that that's important. I think like a lot of the things being said is true. I'm obviously going to be the insulated opinion. I'm less affluent on the nature of the economy than most people on the panel, but I will say that, you know, just speaking from our individual experience and how it affects the debt crisis or things like that, I think that as I said before, the issue is that the economy seems something insulated away from us. And I think that largely we forget that per politics is predicated off of perception. So I'm going to be the, you know, the if you want on the panel, I guess, deviant and defend that I think that legalization of marijuana isn't the worst thing that could ever happen to us. Um, I know nobody in here has ever dabbled with the drug, but I will say that the <laughs> issue is largely that the largely perception-based politics surrounding things like like mar legalization of marijuana or uh, you know things that we think increase um, 
national debt when in all reality we spend a lot of a lot of money um, fighting the war on drugs and a lot of money securing the fact that Mexico doesn't um, have its own money to secure its own legalization of marijuana or its own production of marijuana and maintain it in a, in a way that is insulated where we think our country is actually not supporting legalization of drugs even though our large our system largely supports and stems upon, upon other people not being able to do so so let's say um, you know all of the politics that come out about Mexico in the way that, you know, the, um, a lot of the violence that stems from Mexico and the way that we assume, um, we don't assume <laughs> accountability for those things. So we say perceptionally, I would not like this to be legalized or perceptionally, I don't think that this is a great idea. If we were focusing on, on purely the economic standpoint or purely um, the way that we see things, then I think our generation is more liberal than we lead on. And when discussing issues that we, that are primarily or were primarily like stigmatized historically, that leads to issues when our generation doesn't feel comfortable to express changing the way that politics happen and changing the way that we hold politicians accountable for the way that they spend money. If marijuana is terrible, then why do you support tons of systems and tons of countries that, that disperse and support marijuana? Why do we never talk about the way that cocaine flooded um, the US or how the war on drugs actually started? Um, we don't because it's largely politically unpopular and that's because politics is based off a of perception. So when we engage in discussions, I think that it's important that we maintain our generation isn't the generation before us in certain ways and we are more liberal in the way that we think about things and I think that those things can help us stem away from kind of old school politics that don't hold politicians accountable so that's kind of my thought. Any other thoughts on how you guys feel you may be affected by the national debt? Poor. We, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say as we think we move forward especially I know I'm going to college now and I think that a lot of the problems with the national debt, it's going to increase our interest rates, especially for things like student loans. It's going to make it harder for us to get jobs when we come out of college. I know youth unemployment is something that's very important to the economy and a lot of economies around the world. And I think that if we don't solve problems like the national debt, we're just going to have more and more issues with creating jobs and allowing kids that are especially going into um, different career paths <coughs> that aren't the traditional STEM career paths. We need to help them get jobs. And I think that if we're not solving problems like the national debt, it's going to be very, very difficult for our economy to move forward, create jobs, and really sustain economic growth, especially for people that are in my generation and kind of moving towards college and beyond. Uh, if I may, um, I'd like to just reference what Q was talking about, about the uh, international drug trafficking. I think it's a good example of what I was talking about earlier, which was uh, examining how we use the money that we send to programs and whether or not we can fix that. So an example of what Q was talking about and what uh, Sabah was talking about, about the legalization of marijuana, as an international example, and I'm going to keep pulling back to Europe for this, uh, Portugal decriminalized um, all drug offenses in 2006, I believe, and they shifted the focus of their spending against drugs from uh, drug prohibition towards uh, rehabilitation, harms production, education, and they cut the amount of money, they cut the spending, which obviously helps with the uh, national debt there, and have seen much more effective results. And whether or not you believe in the legalization of drugs, I think this example is something that we can take with us when we look at programs and say, look, we may not agree on how we should handle how liberal, how conservative we should make this policy is, but we can look at this, we can compare it to other countries, and we can see that what we're doing isn't the best way to do this. So why don't we experiment with a different methodology and a different way of spending and allocating money and as a way to address things like the public, uh, the public debt. So if we cut uh, the amount of money we spend on the war on drugs in half and reallocated it towards things like harms reduction and education, and that worked, not only would we have more effective drug policy, we would have taken a substantial step towards decreasing the public debt. I agree with Keller on that in terms of uh, shifting our focus on where we allocate money uh, while obviously working with drug programs and legalization of drugs is a very hot button issue. I feel that we also need to focus on investing in the boring issues or the ones that most people don't think of like infrastructure or research and development. Those are the things that got our economy to where it is today. Those are the things that made the American economy great. And unfortunately, because of partisanship, like Q was talking about earlier in politics, people are like, oh, well, let's spend on defense. Or, oh, we got to save 
uh, health care, social security, which yes, again, those all are important. That's what we're talking about. But if we don't shift the focus back onto the things that set the foundations for a stable economy, then our generation is going to be hit by that wall when our current infrastructure and our current research all starts to go downhill because it eventually will. We're already seeing that with our infrastructure. Our research is nowhere near what it needs to be, even though we are still leading the world in many categories of research. And so really, I feel to uh, work and solve this issue, we have to focus on the long-term solutions, then try and get past politics on it. OK, I have one last question for the, uh, uh, for the group tonight. And then we'll open it up to Q&A from the audience. Uh, but uh, this has been referenced a couple times, and um, I just I want you to all be very direct on this because I'm going to ask a very direct question. Do you get, guys feel like the baby boomers, my generation, have essentially kicked the can down the road and are counting on you guys to deal with this problem or and are basically putting it in your hands and saying, hey, deal with it? I would say collectively, yes. Um, I mean, I'm not saying any individual person, you know, necessarily in this room has that goal. I hope not. But uh, I think collectively it has turned into more of a situation where politicians are trying to, you know, make sure that the older generations, the baby boomer, boomer generation, has the health care that they need in the present day. And so that's why a lot of funding is going towards Medicare rather than taking more preventative measures. So I think collectively, yes. Yeah, I want to hear what the rest of you think about that, too. That's a great answer. Um, I think public policy is broken right now. I think that there's too much of an infusion of money in politics. And I think that people that are in public policy and congressmen and congresswomen don't really understand future implications of their actions. And I think with things like Iron Triangles, interest groups, and all these things, it just becomes so easy for us to spend money. And we don't understand the implications of spending money. And I think that maybe some of these programs like Social Security, like Cheyenne said, were good in the past, but they're not really good for the future. And I think if we don't understand that they aren't good for the future and we don't start spending where we need to start spending money, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. So I think if we, don't, if we don't stop the infusion of money in politics and start looking at public policy for what it is, a service to the people, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. I would very much agree with that. I think that... In addition, to, I think that maybe in the past, your typical lobbying leading to special interest groups benefiting was very much in the form of some kind of pork barrel project where you would get a big bridge or a fancy power plant or whatever in your hometown. I think that now it's much more so that you can lobby and that you can get a, a tax exemption and that we have created a political dialogue where the idea of raising any kind of tax on anybody is so toxic that once that makes it into the tax code, it's very difficult to take it out. And so I think we're inheriting a tax code that's very difficult, almost, well, that's impossible to touch politically and very difficult to understand and to make better. And I think that that makes addressing that number much more difficult because we're not able to just look at the two sides of the equation and say, should we cut spending or should we raise taxes? We're only looking at the spending side. And while there might be places that you can find that you should cut, I think that it's impossible to have the discussion without also looking at the money that you're taking in. To the question if I hold people culpable, yeah. Um, but I don't think it's a generational gap. I, I think that that's largely an issue is, well, yes, there are people who are culpable for the current situation. But I think that in a lot of ways, my stress is to um, focus on the ways that the people who do not engage in politics choose to engage in politics because I think that especially regarding this discussion, the way that certain people feel about things are not the things that represent the um, policy in general. And so I think that, yes, a lot of people in general, I hold a lot of people culpable for the ways that we are hands-off approach to the way that the government operates. So I do hold older generations culpable for not caring, I guess, in certain ways, or not, or not believing that they can change something for us in the way that it implements change in the future. But I also hold our generation culpable for um, displacing blame on older generations for the, for the situation that's going to affect us and the generations that follow us. So, you know, we're not the baby boomers. I'm not sure what we'll be called, you know, the hipsters, the hippies, whatever you want to call it. But this generation and the way that it implements politics is going to be the one that the next generation holds culpable for change. And that's ultimately what I wanted to stress, which was that I think that Amanda also can definitely tune you in on why voting is good. Um, but I think that um, largely, 
the issue is a lack of participation from the people whose opinions can change things. And that's not to say that I am the most, um, you know, it's not to say that everybody needs to become the next politician. It's just to say that the policies that we expect, we need to have strong opinions about those policies. So people who shy away from healthcare or people who refuse to focus on things like, I mean, or people who focus on healthcare as somebody getting and receiving instead of giving money, but don't focus on the fact that like, all you local residents of Kansas who get to go to the college for a certain rate of money um, as per like out-of-state tuition. Those are all forms of like affirmative action that cost money that we don't focus on, right? And we think of things like healthcare as, I mean, healthcare does spend a lot of money, let's be real, it's 25% of the budget, but I think that, you know, we shy away from the things that do affect us, like our tuition and the fact that we're going to be poor in a couple of years, um, and focus on larger structural issues, which is the way that I think that, you know, the economy becomes insulated and we get to blame an older generation um, when we're going to be the next generation to blame, in my opinion. Yeah, I definitely agree with a lot of what you said and, and Amanda, too, about policy. In, in terms of, of Social Security, Bill, I don't fault your generation for growing old. Um, thank, thank you, Will. I'll remember that when you're in the office tomorrow. Afternoon. But in, in terms of kicking the can, um, I don't think it's a generational thing. I, I really do fault uh, some of the policies. Is, is the, the generational uh, effects of Social Security um, kicking the can? No. Is borrowing from Social Security kicking the can? Yes. Is cutting taxes, uh, you know, right after we have a, a deficit and we're rebounding a, a smart fiscal policy? No, it's it's kicking the can. And so I think that there's smart uh, fiscal policy that we can have, good public policy, like you said, Amanda. Um, that's it's not a, a, a partisan thing. Um, we saw the Bush administration have a stimulus, and you saw the Obama administration have a stimulus. Um, so I think there's good fiscal policy that we can do. Um, and that just really stems from, like you were saying, priorities and, and listening to, you know, not just the lobbyists, not just the special interest groups, but the people who are ultimately going to take on this debt. Uh, well, I'd like to go ahead and say that, uh, no offense to you, Bill, but I really, I don't like this question because it's, it goes back to what Amanda said at the beginning of this, and that we need to stop pointing fingers when we're addressing this issue. And I agree with what everyone said. This isn't a generational issue, and I don't fault uh, your generation for getting old either. It's just, <laughs> it's just when we when we do this kind of thing, when we point fingers and say the the last generation has absolutely destroyed our chances, we have to deal with this thing that they could have solved. It's sh it's shying away from the problem. It's what we've all been talking about. The problem is here, and we have to deal with it, and we have to start dealing with it right now. And at the end of the day, it's it's something that it's something that. Pointing, fi pointing fingers at other people is something that we see in politics. When we talk, when everyone dislikes the partisanship in Congress and how ineffective our Congress can be, and yet we do the same thing on things like the public debt and say, well, it's their fault, it's, it's pretty reprehensible to hold politicians to such a higher standard than ourselves and hate on them and blame them for the problems when we're doing just as bad things. So. There is some culpability with the last generation for the problem we're in now, but I think talking about that isn't productive, and I think that it's our job to solve the problem. I, oh, go ahead. I wouldn't necessarily say that they're kicking the can down the road or passing the buck onto our generation. Kind of like what, what Q was saying is that every generation deals with something that uh, the other generation is going to blame them for. So I'm sure their generation got blamed for something. We're going to get blamed for something further down the road. So it's we can't look at it as a short-term problem. It's just something that we've got to fix and focus on and move on. So we can't play the blame game and it just we have to take responsibility and just move on from the problem and try and take action to attempt to fix it in the best way we can. I agree uh, in that uh, it is not necessarily a short-term problem, that again, there will always be problems, and I do feel that we need to have more long-term planning. Keller got into a good point, talked about partisanship and uh, all that, and I feel that if we hold our politicians accountable in the long term where we say, no, we don't want tax cuts right now, we don't want big defense spending right now, if we can get the, if we as voters come to that maturity level, where we realize, okay, what's good today isn't necessarily good uh, in the long run, 
then I feel that we can actually get to solving this national debt and getting our economy back up to speed. Like Keller said, pointing fingers isn't going to help. And so that's why we need to stop pointing fingers and we need to start agreeing, okay, things are pretty bad now, but let's start going on. Let's focus on the future right now because we can still turn it around. It just takes some hard cuts and more involvement. I'm kind of going to take a middle road on this. Um, to an extent, and I'm going to paraphrase J.K. Rowling here, there's an expiration date on blaming the next generation or the previous generation. At some point, we have to take responsibility and say, you know, they might have created this problem, but we have to deal with it, and that's just the way the cookie crumbles. But on the other hand, we also need to have this conversation and, and have a productive conversation about this so we can understand why this problem exists, and so we can make sure that this doesn't happen in the future, because we are all concerned about this, and so we should make sure that we learn from this and that we don't pass this problem along. I think, um, and this maybe this is a utopian thought, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the national debt specifically, but I think we as young people need to engage in a sort of meaningful discourse that allows us to shift our thinking from like, the short-term thinking that everyone has, which I think blame is associated with. Like, I don't think we would blame people for things if we had that sort of long-term outlook where we just inherently knew that we had to solve the problem. Like, if we could figure out a way to change our societal system so that um, instead of raising um, kids to think like, to sort of like shift the blame around kind of like what we're talking about. Like if we raise everyone to have the, that individual responsibility and know that everyone is personally responsible for a lot of different things, I feel like we can solve a lot of like the root cause of a lot of those problems because we won't just like sit out and say like, oh, this is the fault of another generation so we shouldn't have to face it. Like we have to deal with it now so, so should the generation after us. I feel like if we can shift that sort of mindset to a place where we can all take individual responsibility and stop blaming people for like anything in general and just sort of take a course of action instead of sitting around and discussing whose fault it was, then we can get that long-term picture and ultimately achieve the goals that we want to. I'm a big fan of holding people culpable, so I guess I'm the unpopular opinion. Um, I think that it's not an individual reaction, and I obviously think shifting blame into certain situations is bad, and I don't think that we should force the older generation, because I think the issue with the older generation uh, is the issue with the current generation, which is the inability to hold politicians culpable for, for interactions, and so my issue is not like, you're to blame or you're to blame, but this policy is not good and it's not representing X thing, and I think that those are productive conversations and productive places where we can say, yeah, that was bad, and I think that politicians get away, um, or like, by politicians, I mean that the politicians represent what the people want and what, the, what they think perceptionally we want to hear. So when they say they're going to create job stimulus as per after the recession, and we all got the news that everybody was going to get jobs, uh, nobody had thought through the long plan that they were giving people construction jobs and that those jobs were going to go away. Um, and so, yeah, people had jobs for a year or two while they built a couple roads, and then people were out of work again. And I think that l largely the issue is that we become satisfied with a quick answer. And so I think everybody's correct in that we need a long-term solution. And, um, but I mean, you have to also be reasonable with what every person can do and which every person can vote and understand and you know implement what policy. So I think that it largely becomes a conversation of what do we think we can change about the economy and how do we think that we can change it? Well, I mean, we're at a generational issue where we're all going to college and we don't have the money to do so. Um, and that we're not all finding jobs when we get out and we're not all finding, um, we're not all studying skilled labor in the way that we used to understand it. And we're all getting degrees and we don't know what to do with those degrees. And so after, um, we don't know what to do. I don't know if you have older siblings, but I definitely do. <laughs> They've definitely both graduated college and definitely hung out with me for another year. Um, I think that <laughs> the conversation then becomes, how do we, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just want to say that we should force people to take responsibility. I don't mean that we should shift blame to avoid the issues, but I do think that holding policies and people culpable for certain I'm an African American studies <laughs> major. I definitely believe in holding politicians culpable. I think that's the only way things get done. Uh, but I think that largely it stems from changing the public opinion about what the policy is, and then that 
allows for people to you know, rally up and say, okay, yeah, you're right, we do need to change that, absolutely, that's something that needs to change, but that also starts from the first person raising their hand and being like, yep, that was bad, so. <laughs> okay, I am gonna open it up to any questions that we have in the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Claire will come by with a microphone. Is anybody helping you tonight, Claire? Okay, so <laughs> Claire is in charge. Uh, please ask a brief question, and then we'll get a couple of the students to respond to it. Um, um, a couple of you mentioned like Social Security a lot tonight, and like um, many of you mentioned reform, and some of you kind of hinted at like the idea of even getting rid of it entirely. Um, so my question is, what would be your policy reform idea or your alternative entirely for Social Security? Anybody want to try that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there needs to necessarily be a system to replace Social Security if we can teach people about finance and um, good ways to save money. Because basically what Social Security is, is like providing funding for the later years of life when you shouldn't have to work anymore. But if we can let people save those dollars that they're putting into Social Security, then they'll have that when they're older and like we won't need the system at all because people will still have the money because they won't have paid it in. They will have learned how to successfully save money and make good financial decisions so that they have available funds when they no longer want to work. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, and I'll just keep it short, but the question you're asking for are concrete policy reforms we should implement. A few things I mentioned is we should stop stealing funding from those programs and spending them on other programs. Uh, we should raise the age at which people become eligible for benefits, as painful as that might be. Uh, we should lower the amount that the program pays out, uh, which will also be very painful without uh, adjusting how much it takes in, at least for a small period. Uh, I think those are all steps that could balance the problem, even though they would uh, definitely be painful to weather. I think what we need to realize when we talk about social secure, about that being painful, is that that painful would, it, when, you, when you think about an individual person for who that would be painful for, that would be an individual living on a fixed income that would suddenly decrease. Mm -hmm. And so, you would have to ask yourselves, yourself whether there is a social safety net that's in place that could do things like provide housing or provide food that that used to provide for because we are lucky enough in this country to have, I mean the reason why we're excited to have social security is because we don't have a situation where a huge number of elderly people are living in very deep poverty without necessarily their parents or something to take care of them. Um, and so I did not talk about reforming Social Security, but something that I think we might want to think about is thinking about the amount that goes to each individual. So we could look at a, an individual and be able to say, all right, you do have a very nice retirement fund. It is possible that you, thank you for paying into Social Security, but it appears that you do not need it to subsist. We're going to take that money and make sure that it's going to somebody who really needs that check to make sure that they can pay rent. Social security checks are not large. That's kind of my premise issue of focusing on individual-based politics and then saying that the individual-based politics shapes the way that the perception of those policies are implemented, just like I'm sure the average person does not feel like they get that much money on health care, or the average person does not feel like, you know, they can, I don't know, I might be divorced, but from what I think the average person is, but costs a lot of money to go to the doctor and those are things that we think about as so insulated and if we're spending so much money on health care why aren't and it's so much on treatment and it's so much on this than the average person that doesn't have financial backing uh, it, it forces our generation right the generation that we're saying to move and change politics to question in what ways are we receiving the quote unquote money that we're spending um, which is largely predicated off the fact that we spend a lot of money on insurance and a lot of money on waivers and a lot of money on the money of making money right that's the way we make money is to build systems that also make money to create the revenue for us to then receive the treatment um, which is questionable at best. So I don't know, social security, that's kind of a, oh, an odd question because then I think it gets kind of weird when I'm like, Susie, you don't get a thousand anymore, you get 500 because you're ruining the economy. She's like, well, I can't pay for rent on $500. So uh, I think that like, 
I don't really know enough about Social Security to say that people aren't banking, but I can probably say that they're not getting rich off of Social Security, and that's probably not the larger structural issue within the economy. Okay, I want to move a little bit faster here, so we're going to go to our next question. Yes. <clears throat> I would just accept a show of hands from the panel for this question. Would it surprise you to le learn that Social Security, by law, cannot spend any more money than it takes in from the payroll, than the dedicated payroll tax for Social Security, and therefore cannot contribute to the national debt, and therefore is irrelevant to the entire subject that you came here tonight to discuss? Is that news to you? Do we have a show of hands? Yes, because politics is perception-based. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I So you knew that. that? No, absolutely not. Next question. <laughs> okay. Uh, like I'm I'm going to be honest with you guys cuz I want you to like give me an honest answer, but like the debt is honestly an issue that really scares me. I uh like I one of the reasons I dropped out of college is because like the idea of paying back all of that money was too much. I couldn't handle it. So, yeah, forget that. Uh, um, I'd like to at least talk about for a little bit, could you guys discuss like the whole military spending? We haven't really touched on that as much as I'd like to at least. And I feel like that's where a lot of the money's going and I feel like that could help like that really intimidating countdown that's going over there. So could we talk a little bit about like spending or cuts or tax or whatever when it comes to the military spending? I think we approach a lot of our military entanglements the wrong way. Um, I think one of the examples that I'd probably like to talk about is um, especially things like terrorism. I think that we don't focus on what the root causes of things like that are. I think that we don't understand that a lot of these societies are impoverished and that a lot of these terrorist organizations are providing things like social services and food and water and shelter to these people. And that's a lot of the reason why there's a lot of high-level recruitment. And I think that if we change our perception of what, every time we have something like a terror, ter 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 terrorism like ISIS and we want to go and spend a lot of money on things like first strikes and like military engagements and like boots on the ground, if we rather look at what are the root causes of these problems and kind of help these countries establish strong states where they have governments that can help solve these issues, we're going to be spending a lot less money on foreign entanglements, and we're going to be spending money in a productive way. And I think a, a big way that we can help decrease the money that we spend on military engagements is that we focus more on things like foreign aid and focus on better ways to build societies that are sustainable. It's because the reason why we have low levels of homegrown terrorism in the United States is because we have sustainable societies and sustainable economy much better than a lot of other countries. And I think if we understand different ways to tackle a lot of those problems and we work on things like diplomacy and foreign aid, I think we'll be able to decrease military spending and that'll help our debt in the long run as well. I think that one of the main issues with our, the way we approach military conflict is that we're still sort of stuck in this Cold War mentality of, oh, there's a threat, the Reds are coming, we've gotta go get them. The entire world isn't like that, and I would especially say this is relevant for like the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we kind of created those conflicts, if you think about it, and so we have to be better about knowing the reasons why we're going into a conflict and be better about knowing what the react. I don't want to say what could happen if we go there, but to a reasonable extent, how people might react if we go there. Yeah, and, and ultimately it comes down to priorities. I mean, when you're spending more on these on these interventions in foreign countries, that's money that could be going to Pell Grants. That's money that's be going to Perkins loans and ultimately funding things that, that our generation prioritizes. So I think that when you prioritize uh, defense over things like education and infrastructure and other good types of government spending. Um, you really take a whole generation and, and, and really um, they're, they're disadvantaged because of that priority. And the other thing I want to say too is that defense spending is a very large portion. Um, I said before, one-fifth of the, spe the defense spending could um, take care of that social security gap. So I think there's a lot of ways, like you said, that we could cut down defense spending and allocate that to things that we should prioritize. Okay, we're gonna take one last question over here. 
Uh, there was a lot of talk tonight about health care reform, but I think it was absent of mentioning the Affordable Care Act. So a quick question about that. In regards to the national debt, health care reform, and most importantly, preventative health, what are your thoughts on the majority of states opting out of the Affordable Care Act expansion? Yes, that's a pretty technical question. So, uh. well, so I, I think that maybe what is exciting about the Affordable Care Act is that it was a large piece of legislation that included some pay-fors. Uh, so it included reductions in the amount that a hospital would receive for Medicare, for example. Um, that is ideally what we're talking about when we're talking about good public policy. Like we might like or dislike the idea of having more people having health insurance or the idea of having government provide health insurance. But if the government is going to fund to insure more people using subsidies or using Medicaid expansion, then it's probably a good thing if that's accompanied by some kind of pay fors. Um, the struggle is that some states have decided that they would not like to expand Medicaid to 138% of the poverty level, um, but they're not able to opt out of the taxes or out of the fees. And so you have a situation where in Kansas, rural hospitals are really, really struggling because they had all of the cuts from the Affordable Care Act, um, but they didn't receive any of the benefits in terms of having more customers or more insured people. And so like in my grandma's hometown in Yamaha County, uh, they just passed a half cent sales tax increase to fund the local hospital because we aren't getting, even though all of you are pay, just paid your federal income tax on April 15th and paid for people in California and New York and now Montana and a lot of other states to have expanded insurance, your hospitals and your economies aren't seeing the benefit of that. Um, and so I suppose that is the decision of the majority of the voters of the state of Kansas. But uh, fiscally, I don't know that that makes a lot of sense. I think, I think the Affordable Care Act is one of those things that's a long-term policy, and I think that if a lot of states are opting out, they don't really understand the long-term policy. And that goes back to what he was talking about. It's very perception-based, and I think if we understand that uh, the more and more people we have opting into that type of program and having health care, it's better for us in the long-term because we're paying out less in terms of um, the taxpayers paying out for people, and we're going to lower our, uh, our spending that we spend on things like Medicaid and stuff like that. So I think if we, if states understand that opting out is just going to hurt in the long term, it's going to create a more problem with the Affordable Care Act. They're going to understand that it's good to opt in and it's good to move forward and have more people have health care. I fear what was brought up earlier is accurate. I fear that like the conversations or the productive conversations we have that shape a certain policy without the knowledge of the way that it affects things fiscally, that my opinion is largely um, uncontextualized to the situation just as um, we spent a lot of time talking about um, social security and if that doesn't actually increase our deficit then we had a lot of productive conversation that wasn't productive. Um, which is confusing, right? <laughs> um, because the things that we present to ourselves, especially in conversation among peers, might not be capable of being changed or affected, um, which largely confuses me on how <laughs> we change things, right? If the average person engages in conversation and what we hear is that social security and healthcare is what's spending all of our money and the Affordable Care Act is the thing that's destroying us, um, then it distracts us from possibly it being a long-term solution and it becomes politically uh, you know, motivated rather than economically motivated, which um, I think is largely what we've all discussed is the issue, um, is that it becomes perception-based politics. So I can say that engaging in a perception-based political discussion, for example, about Social Security, we gave our opinions <laughs> about where we think like money should be going or should not be going, but if that's not the actual policy that we can change, um, then it leaves us kind of confused, <laughs> which I think is the issue. <laughs> I still think, a dis even if Social Security is not relevant to the national debt, I still think it's a discussion worth having because all of the problems that we discussed are still problems, even if Social Security doesn't acquire funds from, like, deficit spending. It's still a problem, like, that there are less people paying into it than people receiving money. And we still have to address the fact that people receiving benefits will have to receive less benefits or people paying into it will have to pay significantly more than probably most of us could afford to. And so I still think that discourse is meaningful even if it's not necessarily addressing the national debt. It's still a conversation worth having because we're still talking about advancing future policies and addressing issues that are like really couldn't be more relevant because they have to be solved for our generation to progress and create the necessary new policies to get the changes that we want to see. 
Okay. Guys, this has been a terrific discussion. Thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. We really greatly appreciate it. We appreciate the participation of our panelists. And I uh, hope to see you here Sunday afternoon for the Dole Lecture at 4 p.m. Thank you all for coming out.